you know, I had, going into this, um, I had the idea that, you know, there were basically two groups of violinists. You know, there were the pros and, and the not pros. Mm-hmm. And only the pros were going to be interested in these little detailed, you know, even though, and I, I've never been the, the kind of person that looks down on non-professionals because I, I'm a non-professional in everything else I do. And, <laughs> and, and a lot of those things I take seriously. And, and I know for myself, you know, like cooking, for example, I do a ton of cooking. And I love the details. I, I want to know exactly how to do something just right, even though I'm not going to run a restaurant. So I don't know why I thought things would be different for the violin, but I did. I'm so happy to bring you this conversation with Nathan Cole of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and natesviolin.com. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And Nathan Cole and his wife, Akiko, have just started a podcast called Stand Partners for Life. Now, I've known Nathan for years and years. He actually used to play in the Chicago Symphony prior to joining the LA Phil. And my wife was subbing on harp in the Chicago Symphony and said, there's this violinist named Nathan who's got this great website. You got to check it out. I checked it out back in the mid 2000s and thought it was amazing. And it has been so fun following along with what Nathan's done over the years. So we dig into that. We dig into this great new podcast of his, Stand Partners for Life with Nathan and his wife, Akita. Kiko. There are three episodes out now as I'm putting this out and you got to tune in, subscribe. You can go to natesviolin.com for all the info or standpartnersforlife.com and there are links in the show notes. This podcast is brought to you by some sponsors that actually offer things way beyond the bass player. So let me briefly mention all of them. Upton Bass String Instrument Company is, of course, four bass players, great company. They've been a supporter for years and years. UptonBass.com is where you can learn more about them. Diderio Strings, and of course, Diderio makes strings for violin, viola, cello, and bass. I've been playing on their Kaplans recently. I've used Zyx and Helicor in the past. They've been a great supporter for the show, and they're making wonderful strings at a price point that is great for professionals, students, everybody. So thank you to Dario and Robertson and Sons Violins, which has not only basses, but they are one of the world's great places to look for any string instrument. Robertsonviolins.com is their website. And if you're in the Chicago area, A440 Violin Shop has a wonderful array of, again, violin, viola, cello, and bass instruments, bows, great for repairs, you name it. A440ViolinShop.com. So this is such a fun conversation. I got together with Nathan at his place in the LA area as I was passing through a few months ago. So excited to hear about this podcast and just chat with Nathan, who's doing a lot of the same sort of work that I'm doing, of course, with a different perspective and different set of experiences. I have listened now to all three of the episodes that are out right now. They're wonderful, and I just can't wait to see what he and Akiko do with this podcast. So here is my conversation with Nathan Cole. Here with Nathan Cole, who and I think I discovered your online presence like a while ago when you were in Chicago you already had Nate's violin at the site full of great material my wife was subbing with the Chicago Symphony she said you know there's Nathan Cole this musician in the Chicago Symphony has this great site and I was looking through it and so it's great to have you on the podcast oh thanks awesome to be here (laughs) and when did you start doing things online when did you start building out Nate's violin Nate's Violin, I think, was 2001. That was when I had my first job in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. So I was, you know, a 20-something with only one thing to do, which was to show up to work. And then the rest <laughs> of the day, I had nothing <laughs> nothing going on. So I just kind of sat up in my uh, condo and played around building a website. Although I think the, the first websites I did were actually back in 94, 95. That was like the really? wild... <laughs> West that, you know, didn't have my own domain name or anything like that. It was probably like a GeoCities or an Earthlink site or something like that. And uh, just kind of putting stuff up there and you'd get this delight when you'd type in the, the address on some other computer that wasn't in your house. And you'd be like, wow, I can see that from over here too. <laughs> I remember my first GeoCities site. It was like black with green type. It was like Jason yeah. dot GeoCities dot Any com. blinking type? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, there were blinking type appeared for sure at some point in that. <laughs> and I did the first, I actually did the first website for Curtis, uh, Curtis Institute of Music, 
before they had a website. I just kind of did it for them and told them it was up and they were like, okay, cool. And all it was, it was just the catalog. Basically, I typed in the text of their catalog and the audition requirements. And I think I put up, you know, some pictures of the school and all that. But that was my first taste of someone actually writing in and saying, oh, and you know, I see these audition requirements, but can you clarify this? And I was like, wow, I've got all this power. I, I don't, <laughs> I just go to the school. I don't really work for them, but I could write this person back and tell them anything about <laughs> how to get in. <laughs> or, um, so yeah, that, I think that probably stayed up for about a year before they said, no, we need a real website. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Talk about early days though. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Were you always into computers? Yeah, that for sure. Actually, I got my first computer when I was four, which was the same time as I got the violin. So it was an old Atari. Um, got to, you know, program a little in basic. But then I never took the programming very far, and I wish I had. I remember getting, I had a Commodore 64, a good old uh-huh. Commodore 64, and I remember getting Commodore Magazine. And in the back of the magazine, they would have a program that you could enter, and it would be like some game or something like that, but you would sit and type all the... Oh, yeah, exactly. Right? You remember doing that? Yeah, and if you screwed one little character up, the whole thing, nothing would work. Yeah, my poor father, I remember him helping me, because it would be like, data, 360, comma, 12 comma yeah. and you'd have to go through all those lines of code and those always frustrated me because i couldn't figure out what was going on you know i liked <laughs> the programs where i could kind of make sense of them but then those never did as cool things so <laughs> well and it's great that you got your first computer and you started violin at four mm-hmm. at the same time and you grew up in kentucky yeah right? lexington kentucky lexington kentucky okay because my father was uh the flute teacher at the University of Kentucky. And then playing violin as a youngster. Could just take us maybe through uh, a little career journey, like for like like from Kentucky school into like what you're doing now. Sure. Uh, so I stayed in Lexington, you know, up through high school, uh, went to public schools there. Um, I had two teachers growing up. I, so I started in the Suzuki method and I do they do Suzuki bass at they, this point? They have ju it yes, it's in its real early stages still. Uh Suzuki teachers might not think so, but it's it's still not widely adopted, but it's it's getting there. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I mean it was definitely in full swing by the early eighties and so I did that and I unlike many people I actually went through all ten Suzuki books and did a graduation recital and everything, which is maybe a little bit too long in Suzuki, but I had a great Uh, first teacher. And when I was 10, I switched to the teacher that would take me, you know, through high school to to music schools and all that. Um, Dan Mason was his name. And he had studied with Heifetz out here, you know, in the 70s. And so that was a really cool, even though I didn't know it at the time, it was really cool to get that perspective. And I've gone back to him since, you know, to ask, what did you mean when you said this? And why did we work on this etude? <laughs> um, so from there, I went to Curtis in Philly, and I was there four years. And I was thinking of staying an extra year there. But right at the end of my, my fourth year, I, I won the job as principal second in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And even though I, I, I wasn't sure about joining an orchestra, that really appealed to me because it seemed kind of like chamber music, yet it was an orchestra and I I wanted that kind of stability. I I, I had a real fear at that time of sort of drifting around somewhere. You know, I would see my friends were, you know, they'd say, I'm going to go to grad school in New York and play in some chamber groups. And I just, I needed something more certain than that. And that's something I've definitely second guessed probably (laughs) once a month, (laughs) not, you know, not to say I was wrong, but, but just second guess, like what if, but I moved, you know, by myself age 22 to St. Paul, Minnesota. And yeah, hence all the time to mess around with uh, HTML, but uh, I was there two years. And then a friend of mine who was in the Chicago symphony said, Hey, we have an opening here for principal second, your principal second in St. Paul. Hey, you know, that natural, fit for you there um but i auditioned for that like i think it ended up being three times okay (laughs) didn't get it (laughs) but uh, but on the second audition um they had a section opening and so i I was able to get that and stayed in chicago for nine years almost all that playing in the first violins and then here in la where i'm um i have a 
crazy long title, but I'm second chair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then my wife, Akiko, is fourth chair with uh, not, not as crazy long a title. Mm. And the... So Nate's violin, how, how, what was, so like I started this site of my own in 2005 and it was like a bunch of links for my students and I basic, you know, more or less. And then I put out a couple of articles about bass and it just sort of evolved from there. How did Nate's violin evolve for you? What was that very first site iteration like? Um, my idea in having the site at first, it, it, it was going to be one of two things, um, neither of which really happened, but <laughs> I thought at first, you know, I had never heard of Facebook and well, I guess maybe it didn't even exist in 2001, but I had, I'd been taking pictures most of my life and I had pictures of friends and teachers and all that. And I thought, oh, it'd be cool. You know, I, I'll, I'll have a site where, you know, I'll put up a picture of me and some friends, you know, and they'll probably it'll be classical musicians and whatnot. And then if you click on one of them, you'll be able to see all the other pictures of that person that I have on the site. So it'll be like this whole picture web or something like that. And I just never had the know how to try and pull that off. And I'm not sure how interesting that would have been anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my other thought was, yeah, perhaps even more vain, which was just that I'm going to keep a practice journal for me because I think it's a, I've always thought it's a good thing to do. And then other people could kind of read it if it was helpful to them. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that obviously was a much more useful <laughs> thing for other people. So when I would follow through with that and put my practice journal up, occasionally people would read that. I don't know if they would search for, you know, terms on Google or AltaVista or whatever, but however they would find it, they might write in and say, oh, interesting that you worked on that. You know, tell me more. How did you work on it? How did this work? And that really that gave me a real sense of purpose. I thought, okay, well, this could really do something. This, this could help people. But back then it was just, it was harder to, there was no social media, right? right. You couldn't, if you felt like you had a really good idea, um, it was hard to spread it around to a lot of people unless they just happened to find you. And so I got just a little impatient. I thought, eh, I'm going to keep my practice journal in a book because it's easier. And right. so I, I just kind of let things go fallow for a few years. When did the videos start for you? Because if you you've put out these fa fabulous videos, and I I learned so much as a bass player watching them. I mean, it's all these lessons about string playing in general, and just music, and so many so many valuable lessons. When, when did that idea come into being for you? What, what was what did that look like in terms of the videos? Well, first of all, I'm I'm flattered that you have seen the videos, and if, if they've been helpful, that that's awesome. I mean, that's definitely the hope. I remember that started, um, I can tell you exactly where it started because I remember the background of the first video that I put <laughs> up, but yeah, it was when I was in Chicago and I think it was 2007. And the idea there was I, I had just been teaching a lot of lessons, um, audition lessons. I, there must have been some audition, maybe even a Chicago Symphony audition happening around that time. And so I remember feeling like I had taught the Schumann scherzo, you know, the scherzo from the, from his second symphony, uh, you know, for 30 days in a row or something. And I remember thinking that I was saying the same things basically every day to the same people. Right. And I thought, you know, <laughs> I could just preempt this by making, you know, first of all, making a video of how I would play it. And then maybe I'll make some supplementary videos on how I practice it. And then, you know, I wouldn't have to say those things in a lesson. And then even people that didn't come to see me, could and it seems obvious now but there just there wasn't a lot of that back then mm -hmm. especially for um audition stuff so I, I made those videos and it just took forever you know we're classical musicians perfectionists and um i hated the, all the takes i did or, or it'd be perfect up until like the last three notes and then i'd have to <laughs> <laughs> redo it and, you know for this minute long thing i don't know how many takes i did and even just setting the thing up you know putting the camera on a tripod it was even though I'd done a lot of photography, video was a little foreign to me. But, uh, you know, it probably took a week to make that performance video and then some of the supplementary videos that went along with it. And, and I put them up. And yeah, that definitely got a great response because it addressed something very specific that people were trying to do. Where did those first videos go? Did they go on YouTube? Yeah, just up on YouTube. Okay, okay. okay. And I'm, I'm sure I put a link to them from my site. 
But um, that was well, I mean, that was years and years before I thought that it might be a good idea to try and stay in touch with people that <laughs> saw the video and found it helpful. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was no, no kind of email list or, or any follow-up other than maybe a, if someone commented on the video, I might comment back. Yeah, it's amazing how, because you know, I started getting active online 2005, 2006, and it's amazing how much things have evolved from then to now in terms of like, email, like I, I don't think anybody had an email system set up at that point really to, to stay in touch with people or to communicate and like that's been super helpful for me and that's something you've done more and more of I get your emails each week and again read them check out what I totally love following along with what you're up to um, when did you start developing that network like communicating with people through email that was, I can say it was around the time that my twins were born. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can kind of place it then. So yeah, just a couple years ago, actually. Yeah. And um, that was, I, I just, I got some great advice. It was basically sort of what do you have to lose, you know, mm -hmm. in the future, if you have messages that you want to get across to people, you've got to be able to reach them somehow. So, so how on earth, and I, I want to talk about the podcast. I mean, it's, it's so cool that you're starting this, but I, I, I got it. Like you, you have a lot of plates spinning, you know, in terms of like, <laughs> both like professionally w w w in the LA Phil and the other things that you do, you know, terrestrially. And then you've got videos that you're doing and then you're sending out emails and writing, you know, in that capacity. And like, how on earth do you, what does, how do you schedule your time? I think that someone who's sort of achieved what you're at and is doing all these things, I think there's a lot that people can learn. Like, how, how do you get this all laid out in your schedule? Um, well, a lot of times, yeah, some of those plates will fall, okay. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and, and that's part of my process, too, is figuring out what, you know, how much can I handle, how much do I enjoy handling, and what mm -hmm. are the things that eventually I'll, I, I might need somebody else to, to help out with. Because yeah, Kiko does a whole lot too and she you know she's not in this room right now to <laughs> speak to that but there's a lot of child care that that goes into this and so yeah in a way having kids for example can make the scheduling part of it easier because um kids well in our experience with our three kids they need to be on some kind of a schedule mm -hmm. and so if their nap time is basically from two to four and you know that can always change but if their nap time is from two to four and we're not rehearsing at Disney Hall, then those are two hours that I know, you know, these might be my only two hours of the day. Yeah. So then it makes sense for me to decide what I'm going to accomplish there and, you know, set little attainable goals, you know, based on, based on that, you know, I've got like three days worth of nap times and three days worth of after bedtimes, let's mm -hmm. say that I can work. What's been surprising to you about, you know, put, putting out content like you do, educating people online like you're doing, like, have there been any surprises or unexpected feedback you've gotten? Uh, anything like that? Yeah, I, by far, my biggest surprise has been how many violinists are out there taking the violin really, really seriously, mm -hmm. um, but who aren't full-time professionals. You know, I had, going into this, um, I had the idea that you know, there were basically two groups of violinists. You know, there were the pros and, and the not pros. Mm -hmm. And only the pros were going to be interested in these little detailed, you know, even though, and I, I've never been the, the kind of person that looks down on non-professionals because I, I'm a non-professional in everything else I do. Nice and, and, and a lot of those <laughs> things I take seriously. And, and I know for myself, you know, like cooking, for example, I do a ton of cooking and I love the detail. I, I want to know exactly how to do something just right, even though I'm not going to run a restaurant. So I don't know why I thought things would be different for the violin, but I did. I thought, okay, I'm going to, if I make this video about this really sort of high level specific point of technique, it's only going to be the pros that are interested in that. And mm -hmm. that was, a, I had a big awakening on that mm -hmm. because, you know, the, the, these these are the kinds of, you can call them tips or you know, hard won knowledge or whatever you want, but it's the kind of thing that tends to stay locked in the conservatories and music schools. Again, I think because most people think the way that I did, that it's only useful for people who are doing this full time. And, and that's just not true. You know, mm -hmm. every violinist wants to know how to make a smooth bow change. And every violinist wants to know how to play 
quietly, you know, how to start a bow quietly and smoothly. Mm -hmm. So that, that has been the big revelation for me, just how many wonderful amateurs are out there working their butts off to, to get better. And I love talking to people that are starting a podcast or have a podcast going because I feel like like in this like club that we probably have so much that we could talk about. But like maybe just tell us about the podcast, it, Stand Partners for Life. Yeah, that that's the name. And um, so we're at the time we're recording this, we're just a couple weeks away from launching, and it is a show co-hosted by me and my wife, Akiko. So. We're not, uh, occasionally we do get to sit together, second and fourth chair, you know, depending on if people are sick or out right, right, <laughs> in right, the right. LA Phil. <laughs> but most of the time we're not literal stand partners, but there was this sort of partners for life bit. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't know, it seemed hard to come up with a, a name yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the show. <laughs> yours is great. I mean, your, yours is perfect. <laughs> Counterbase conversations. But the show basically grew out of our own conversations in the car on the way to to and from work and you know any any married couple or any two people that have that spend a lot of time together are always going to talk about their day mm -hmm. and if they're working together they're going to talk about work there's going to be some complaining maybe a lot of complaining but but also some constructive and maybe even some far-reaching conversations and while certainly we, we're not we don't think that everything we think about the symphony is it can be interesting to everybody, but there's enough there and enough there that's mysterious, I think, to even a lot of professional classical musicians who don't play in orchestras. We want to share how things work on a week to week basis, and we want people to get infected by the by the spirit, basically, that, you know, what makes us play in an orchestra in the first place, because it's not just stability or earning a living. I mean, it's just some of the most wonderful musical experiences that either of us has had, uh, you know, have been sitting on that stage with a huge orchestra around us. And so we want people to, to feel that and tell a ton of stories about conductors and soloists and screw ups in rehearsal and near misses and concerts and tours and, and all the things that people want to know about. That, well, what a great uh, insider's look, you know, from, from the perspective of a, a, someone who goes to a concert or someone who aspires to be in an orchestra, someone who's in an orchestra and wants to know what things are like in other ensembles. So I can't wait to follow along and I can't wait to hear some of these stories. I'm sure you've got a ton of stories, probably like, you know, years and years of material already. But like, what, what do some of these first episodes look like? Well, the very first episode is... A little bit about uh, what I was talking about earlier, you know, why we do what we do and what the job is like. And, mm -hmm. you know, people that play in orchestras full time, the, you know, they're going to be nodding their heads like, OK, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's the same everywhere. And for people who have always wondered, you know, what what's the real day to day and week to week like in a professional orchestra? That's what we're introducing. And then... Episodes two and three are going to be more a look at us as individuals. You know, how did I get here? How did Akiko get here? Because um, we had pretty different upbringings. My parents are both professional musicians, flutists, and, and my grandfather was a flutist in the Philadelphia Orchestra back in the 40s through the 60s. But Akiko's family, there was really no, certainly no professional music there, and they didn't even play instruments. But the surprising thing about that, you, you know, I, some people hearing that might assume I had the more strict and intense musical upbringing because of that, but it was the opposite. You know, my parents, I think, because they had been through it, really wanted to take things easy and sort of let it happen if it was going to happen. Whereas Akiko's parents, you know, she grew up uh, around New York City and went there for lessons, studied with the big famous teachers, famous classmates, and it was very intense. And she did a lot more practicing as a kid than I did and therefore actually didn't major in music in college. Um, so we took different paths to get here, and so that's what the next couple episodes will be about. And then after that, we're going to be answering questions that people have written into me about, you know, things they want to hear about in the podcast, um, time management, like you asked about, and balancing family life and um, health and, well, a lot of audition talk. People want to know about audition process for sure. I can't wait to follow along with this. There's so, so many fascinating things. And, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on auditioning through the podcast and what people have to ask about. 
it's also interesting to something that I that you know people have a concept of what it might be like to play in an orchestra, and then you get into like the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, for example, and then that reality, how close that matches up to your concept of what you thought it was going to be like. Like, what were some things that were surprising for you when you started playing full time in an orchestra? The biggest surprise for me was the speed at which everything moved. Mm. Um, you know, I was used to, you know, even in conservatory, I think they still sometimes treat us like kids, you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. we're going to work on this symphony for, you know, a month long period mm -hmm. and, and we're going to perform it at the end of that month and really refine it. And that's great, actually. I mean, you really get to know the music and dust around all the little corners and everything. Yeah, but you do get used to that schedule. I mean, it's been for most people who grew up playing music and maybe in youth orchestras, it's always been like that. Yeah. It takes maybe a month or two to put a program together. And so then I got to St. Paul and we started rehearsing on a Tuesday and by Thursday we were performing it. <laughs> and even though it was, I, re I remember it was a program that included Ina Klein and Knox music of all pieces. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> something that most of us could probably play from memory. But yeah, I was, you know, frankly terrified it was like we just started working on this two days ago and you know that's one of the pieces on the program it was you know i forget what some of the other things were but you know after that first concert i remember i was so jazzed up but i was exhausted and i uh, asked the concert master steve copes who's uh, who's still there steve how how do you even come back to do this again tomorrow like i'm used to performing the stuff once we got to do it three four times and he just looked at me and he's like dude, you got to pace yourself. You know, you can't, <laughs> you get, this is not the last concert you're going to play ever. Right, right. <laughs> you, you look like you've just, you know, pitched a world series or something. <laughs> so that, yeah, that, that was, and then the next week came and it was a folder full of all different music. And so that was at the speed. You, you know, something I'm sure something that a lot of people will be curious about both musicians and, and, uh, audience goers, uh, the just like what the what makes you want to play with a conductor a verse you know a specific conductor like like i was just chatting with a woman named alexandra scott who plays in the bavarian uh radio symphony orchestra and simon rattle conducts them a few times a year and just like she, there's something about those rehearsals that it's just they they disappear in the blink of an eye for her and there's just like this magic um and then sometimes it's not the case like that so what what are some kind of a wide question so sorry but like what are some things that make uh, you excited about who's up there on the podium? What are some characteristics of a conductor that makes you really want to work with them? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think, yeah, it, it's tempting to give a really wide answer like, yeah, <laughs> like know, you say, but, but actually I think, I think the answer can be pretty simple. I, we look forward to, or I look forward to conductors that allow the orchestra to function like it's supposed to, which mm -hmm. is you know, it's made up of many bodies, but there's one purpose, there's one message. And if a group can pull that off, those are the really powerful performances. But it takes such a special leader to pull enough focus to make that happen. So, you know, you can think of a conductor like a CEO or a quarterback or whatever, but the, you know, they get the big money because the attention is supposed to be on them. And it's got to be that way in the rehearsal process and in performance. I mean, we save, of course, so much attention and brain power for listening to each other. But in the end, there's got to be one message and the conductor's got to be in charge of that. So someone like Simon Rattle, and I agree, uh, he, I played with him at Curtis once and then here in LA just once in the six years I've been here. And yeah, that was a really memorable week for that reason, because he knew exactly what he wanted and he set the rehearsal environment in such a way that everybody was after that. Mm -hmm. Everybody was after what he wanted and it became what we wanted. And he opened our ears to listen for that and to demand it of ourselves. And when an orchestra can work that way, then the audience gets it. You know, they mm -hmm. get the message that, that the music is, uh, that's in the music. So a, a question I, I think I've asked just about everybody who's doing a podcast, you know, I'm talking is like, like, why a podcast? What inspired you to do that specifically? Well, it, it, for us, it was a chance to, 
almost to, it, it was a scheduled time <laughs> during the week that we could actually sit down and, and talk with each other. And that sounds in a way so silly. It's like you're, you know, you guys live together, you work together, you're around each other all the time. Surely you can talk, but you know, this is an hour, well, or part of an hour anyway, just devoted to what we love about the job. And somehow when the microphone is on, I don't know if you've found this, but thoughts come to you and avenues of conversation open up that just don't in the busyness of the day. You know, yeah, we can have a casual conversation in the car, uh, but I've got to worry about traffic and this and that. But mm -hmm. when Akiko and I can sit down and talk either just between us or with a guest about what we love to do, then that's really enjoyable. And we've, we've found that people have asked, you know, they, they, they want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love, I, there, there is something special about that mic and that being on then what I, what I, the way I think of it for myself, you know, with what I do is it's like, I'm having conversations with people that I would want to be talking with anyway. And it's just like a nice convenient structure to have an interesting conversation. And there's the added benefit of sending out to the world and other people can, you know, be a part of that uh, moment. I like that. And I, I think for the people listening, I mean, certainly to contrabass conversations, because I've taken in, you know, so many episodes over the years that you've been doing it. And I always, what I love is getting inside the minds of your guests. Um, I mean, you have a great way of allowing them to, you know, to give you their special insights. And those have always helped me you know, on a different instrument, I'm, I'm un, uncluttered by my expectations of the violin. So I can just listen for the, yeah, what people have in common, the great artists, how they work and how they think. And certainly, you know, we're, we're hoping that our listeners can, can get those insights too, that, that will help them ultimately do what they want with music. Well, I'm, I'm super honored you, you listened to the podcast. I mean, that like, that's that. So th thank you for checking that out. I'm like, I think there's something really interesting about, li you know, you, you live in your, like I live in my bass world or if you're a violinist or whatever you play, you know, there are all these sort of tropes associated with your instrument and the way, and it, I, I find it so interesting to, to look at things from a you, similar things to what I do, but from a fresh perspective, you know, people play a different instrument, for example, or um, I love listening to uh, different shows about visual arts and that sort of thing. And, and sort of getting inside the mind of, of different people who work in create the creative spaces, but maybe not necessarily in my exact niche. So I'm, I can't wait to, to hear what you, what you two are going to be chatting about. Oh yeah. And I, I was just thinking, of uh, something specific when you had uh, Mike Valerio on the show mm -hmm. and um, a story he was telling, you know, th this being something about a different instrument, but talking about an early gig that he got where he wasn't supposed to bring an electric bass, but he brought it anyway. Right. And uh, that ended up really kind of saving the day and the drummer's kit broke down, but he had the tools there to fix it. And it was just always being that person that's, that's there to make everyone else's life easier I mean, that could apply not only to any instrument, but I mean, any profession, basically, you know, you want to be helpful. Yeah. You, you want to make the, the show go on the best it can. Who are, who are some guests that you're having on uh, in these early episodes? Do you have people picked out? You've done a few interviews at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've, I've got uh, one colleague from the Chicago Symphony, uh, Brant Taylor, a cellist, um, and he'll be talking about, well, we talked about the concept of a sabbatical, mm, mm -hmm. um, you know, why it makes sense to take time off and what do you do with that time off? How do you recharge your batteries? And uh, we talked a lot about chamber music too, which is so important to successfully playing in an orchestra because he was a member of a full-time professional string quartet before joining his first orchestra. I also talked with Zach DePew, who's concert master of um, Indianapolis, because uh, he and I were in school together. I mean, we played in quartet together for years. I, I don't know how many thousands of hours we've played together. <laughs> but we talked a lot about nerves and concert mastering. And um, let's see what else. Um, oh, I also had uh, Hugh Fink, who was a writer for Saturday Night Live for 10 years, I believe, but grew up as a violinist alongside Josh Bell. And so he... We, we talked a lot about performing, the importance of performing um, to 
conquer nerves and to, to find your real voice. So those are some of the, the early guests. And then many episodes will be, yeah, just the stand partners, mm-hmm. <laughs> just me and Akiko. The, the concept of a sabbatical or just recharging in general, you know, even if you're not on a sabbatical, I think is so critical for people in the create, well, everybody, but, but people in the creative arts. Like, what, what do you do to recharge your batteries? You know, again, going back to the, all, the, all the things you've got going, all the plates spinning, what, what do you do to keep grounded and inspired? Yeah, that's a, sometimes I think I, I need to seize more of that time too. It can be, you know, especially in the, the four years since our kids have come along, um, days can start to sort of cascade <laughs> one into the next. But, but actually, you know, having kids to forces you to take time for holidays, for example, you know, bef- before we had kids, yeah, you could blow right through a Thanksgiving or a Christmas and then suddenly you realize it's been six months and especially out here in LA when the weather doesn't change seems like nothing's changing <laughs> but with the kids it's like you know it's Halloween we're yeah. gonna take three days and just make costumes and gather candy and decorate the house and next is Thanksgiving and Christmas I mean kids get excited for that stuff and so that that sort of forces a nice break uh, some nice breaks and, and a nice pace other than that I part of the reason I like doing, you know, photos and videos and recording as, as part of my teaching is because I enjoy all those activities in and of themselves. I just love making videos and taking pictures. So I do more of that. Well, it's, it's been, it's been so great to just follow along with, with what you've done over the years. And I, I've been a fan for a long time and I'm, I'm just so excited for this podcast. So, uh, and I'm sure people can find it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever they listen to podcasts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, iTunes. And if you just go to standpartnersforlife.com, uh, you'll easily be able to subscribe there. And uh, I, I don't ever have scripted questions for these sort of conversations, except I kind of have one, which is some, some sort of advice for younger people. But I usually frame it as like, what advice you'd give your younger self? Um, and maybe even we could go back to that age when you were at Curtis and you were like doing coding the website, putting the catalog up online. And now you've had this, you know, career trajectory that you're in one of the world's great orchestras and, and have just done so many so many exciting things in the music world. What would you tell young Nathan? Uh, what advice might you give him? Oh, I have an easy answer for that because okay. I've thought about it a lot. <laughs> and that would be, especially at that age, uh, go to more live performances. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. That, that's something I, you know, uh, all of us did some of that, but but some of us did more than others. And I, at that age, I think I did a little bit less than some others. Mm-hmm. I just didn't, listen to the advice of people who who told me to go out you know get yourself in the seat get there for for the curtain and watch other people not just listening to recordings but watch other people do what they do and that i think would have inspired me to do more performing solo performing which i think is critical even if you're not primarily going to be a soloist but i think it starts with going to live performances you just you learn things there that you can't any other way and hopefully that inspires you to do some kind of solo performing. Doesn't have to be for a big crowd, big pressure, but to get out there, there too, you'll learn things that you can't any other way. Yeah, there's something about there. That was something that I I kind of did an informal survey looking at people I went to school in Northwestern with, and people that stayed in the practice room on Friday night and went to see the Chicago Symphony or went to see you know jazz, go to a jazz club or do whatever. And I mean, those people that were just out seeing music. You look one year, two years, three years down the road. I'm like, oh, they're on this album. Oh, they're in this orchestra. Or oh, they're they're doing this. You know, uh, the people that were there, like like you know, practicing their pop etudes you know late into the night maybe not as much so that that's that's fascinating that that's that's the that, that's key for you too yeah because you can do both yeah you know do yeah. the pop etudes, <laughs> right but, don't right don't not <laughs> but do them do them an hour before the the symphony concert <laughs> or the you know the recital that you're going to go to yeah and not you know you're not just looking to see the big names or something but i mean go to like at curtis i needed to be going to more curtis mm-hmm. versus, i mean th- those were free seeing my peers uh, perform, because I heard them practice. That was the crazy thing. I knew how everybody practiced. I just didn't always take that extra step to to be there for them, to support yeah. them performing. Mm-hmm. Well, 
Nathan, pleasure. So glad to chat with you for the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And folks, go 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 check it out. Hey, can't wait. I'll be subscribing day one. So. Well, thank you so much. Great. Awesome to talk to you as always. Nathan, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, check out Nathan. Of course, natesviolin.com. If you are not following along there, it doesn't matter what instrument you play. It's top-notch content, great writing, great videos, and now great podcasts. And standpartnersforlife.com will take you directly to the podcast. Subscribe just like you do on Contrabass Conversations through iTunes, Apple Podcasts. You can get it on Stitcher. You can get it on Google Play. And just visit the website and you'll see all those options. And thank you so much for tuning in. Maybe this is the first time you've ever listened to Contrabass Conversations. Welcome. If so, we talk about the bass a lot, thus the name but talk about all sorts of other topics. And I love bringing on people that I find interesting, inspiring, that I know will bring some value to you. Nathan, of course, uh, fits that to to a T. So it's so great to chat with you, Nathan. I just wish you and Akiko all the best for the podcast. And if you want to learn more about what we do here each and every week at Contrabase Conversations, go to our website, contrabaseconversations.com. Join our email list. And by the way, join Nathan's email list if you're you're not on there. It's hugely educational, informative, inspiring, entertaining, uh, great stuff. But we send out emails here too on a weekly basis, uh, more or less. And I'd love to have you follow along that way. Obviously, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. Forward this to a friend, whether they play violin, bass, trombone, or nothing, but you just think it'd be cool for them to hear. That would be awesome. And Let me know what you think of the show, any ideas, any guests. I keep a log of all the suggestions I get in terms of topics, in terms of guests. And I love your input. Feedback at Contrabase Conversations puts you in touch with me. That's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.